I'm with Jeff Leach, everybody. Welcome to Walk Ins. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on the show. Again, apologies for being tardy. I am not normally like that. So That's I uh, quite all right. feel deeply embarrassed. I understand. Things happen. Life, life happens. So I'm an apologetic as well. So I have to, you know, bring it up immediately at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> it's fine. Tell me about your comedy journey. I'm going to talk about this like you're... Like it's a yeah, I mean, ayahuasca. That's a, that's a broad question. <laughs> I love I love hearing the stories of how people get into the mental illness factory that is stand up comedy. It's always oh, okay. different. Yeah, I mean, I got into stand up comedy um, as a gateway drug from uh, from TV hosting for the BBC and Channel Four and some other networks in Europe um, back into my acting. So I, I saw a lot of my. It doesn't work the same as the U.S. You know, in the U.S., you can have the TV show, have the sitcom, have the write the book, host your own chat show, be in movies, etc. You can be the Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres, you know, kind of right. model. Whereas um, in England, it's very much still, what are you? Are you, a, are you an actor? Are you a stand-up? Are you a TV presenter? And pick one of those things and go full hog at it. So I refuse to do that. And uh, I noticed that all my stand-up comedian friends got a lot more film and TV acting auditions than I did as a TV host. So that's why I started. And then I fell in love with it. And I was like, yeah. oh, well, clearly I'm sick in the mind and I'll have to do this for the rest of my life now. Ah, it's the worst. What? Isn't it? Oh. I'm the best. Simultaneously the worst and the best thing it is. you can do. Yeah. I took a long break. No, I mean, yeah, long for stand-up comics. I took a break and then I didn't think I'd go back. I had a baby. How long was your break? Four years, which was okay. decent. Yeah, that's sizable, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the year just kind of got kept stacking up and it was around the pandemic. So I fell in love, got married, had a baby, uh, as a geriatric. And then I recently was like, I kept saying I wanted to go back. And then I kind of hoped that I would bomb when I went back <laughs> just so to like, I hate this. I'm never doing it again. Yeah. To be like, well, right. that was like my lesbian summer phase. I guess I can just <laughs> put it behind me now. And no, unfortunately not. No, nope. you're still enjoying making love to comedy. It's the I like way this, my like brain you see works. Lesbian phase as well. Why did you equate <laughs> comedy to being a sexy lesbian for a summer? That's <sighs> I don't know. It just seemed like that thing that I did that was like a phase, you know. Just tried it on. I mean, for that's a long phase. It was a long seven year phase or whatever. But it it still was something that I was maybe. But I don't know. I think if your brain views the world in bits it, i don't know how you ever really get out of that get pattern. out of that yeah i mean yeah i feel you i wonder if i'll ever be able to stop doing stand-up i have been questioning my place within the world of entertainment for quite a while how come and oh um i don't think that it's a healthy career to be yeah in. <laughs> no it's not it's and not. the more that I, um, the more that I develop as a human being rather than just as a performer, the the less I'm enamored by the industry in which I, I've spent so many years, you know, two decades working professionally. Yeah. I also, you know, I took psilocybin uh, in a <laughs> in a therapeutic way as opposed to a party <laughs> drug. I've been taking it over the last year and had this three really I major, um, you know, uh, uh, mushroom trips. Kind of, I'm talking like hero doses, like seven grams go away on my own to a cabin in the woods or a, or a cabin in the desert and just sit there and really dive internally into my own mind. And, and I've had two major ego deaths and I uh, connected with a state of pure nirvana on the last trip. And I just came out of that and went, oh, oh what am I doing? <laughs> this is that, that pursuit of there's different ways to create art, and I think that um, entertainment or the the machine of entertainment. Once you're at a certain level, which I know we both are, you uh, it preys on ego and desperation and a lot of self interest and money, a desire for money or fame, etc. Which is under the blanket of all the things I just mentioned before. And um, I no longer need the money. I no longer. That's nice. The fame. Yeah. Thank you. It's, 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 I made some good financial choices a few years ago for the first time in my entire life. It took <laughs> almost 40 years to get some fiscal responsibility, but it's paid off. 
Good. And um, and and so so now the desperation's gone. The and mm. so I, I started to really look at does this serve me as I try and evolve as a human being in a more dedicated fashion ongoing. I anyway. mean, you, you could pivot to like the kind of what was that woman who did the like anti comedy stand up special from? I think she's Australian. Hannah Gadsby. Uh, yes, you could you could pivot to like. I like how we knew as well. <laughs> anti comedy. I mean, uh, well, it was yeah. funny because Vulture did this. It wasn't funny. That was the point. It was quite serious. right. It was Vulture wrote this whole kind of dystopian article about how we live in a post comedy world you know like this the, we, we now live in a time where basically <clears throat> comedy doesn't need to be funny which to me is really well, it has under to be regressive short form and regressive aimed at 11 year old children which is what yeah. most of the, the new stars of today seem to be blossoming in from that kind of pool of talent which some of them are actually very talented stand-ups you know someone like trevor wallace um whatever you think of his short form content that brought him fame, which a lot of the characters he does, yeah, they do appeal to a younger audience and their short form in content. But he's also a talented stand up. He's he's good at what he does. Or, you know, we got old Matt the the jawline rife, who, you know, uh seemingly burst out of nowhere, but has been doing stand up for fourteen years or something, since a since a very young man. Now whether you like the comedy or not is a different matter. Right. <laughs> but um yeah. But he's almost, you know, it's weird to see the the difference in in. It's a changing landscape. Entertainment is constantly evolving and changing. I'm sure in another five years' time, it, no real human beings will be doing stand up. There will be AI generated, um, you know, 3D rendered models um, that you can watch do stand up, and then immediately after, you can sidewind them into a, a sex program where you can have sex with them. Oh God, so I'm fine. I'm Dark. so ready for that, Bridget. Are I'm you? so ready for it. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, seems that's, very that's the niche that I've been looking to fill for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like the I, I have so many thoughts. So first, first of all, it I feel like every podcast I do lately, I end up talking to people about their mushroom trips. So there's an explosion of of uh, psilocybin use, <laughs> clearly. And the last guy I talked to actually. He was talking. He was talking about how he had a very long conversation with a tree, and I have amateur. He's just started. He's just started <laughs> his journey. I talked to God the last time. He came one with the one energy of the entire cosmos. It was it, fascinating. It is the best that that connection when you come out of it and you have those ego deaths, as you've talked about. Where mm -hmm. where does it leave you? you know, today on this Wednesday afternoon where you're, are you really able to leave comedy? Do you feel like it's an art? I mean, I'm, I'm very much in a process of like reevaluating a lot of this stuff for myself. And so I'm interested to, I don't know. I've been thinking so much about all this stuff. I also recently watched the supermodels documentary on Apple plus okay. about the, the like Cindy Crawford, Naomi Campbell, the four You've been considering a career change into that world. Yes, obviously. Um, yep. but I was thinking about how there, I was like, is Kim Kardashian the last icon like i was thinking about how there aren't I really i hope not jesus taylor Christ. swift maybe what? maybe taylor swift what? bridget you're such a white woman <laughs> to consider taylor swift an icon i mean come on she is she an incredible is, businesswoman no she's a businesswoman she's a brilliant businesswoman she is a very average performer in my opinion she's a very average performer she can't really dance that well she's sing of singing voices whatever She's a product of a brilliant machine, but she's a great businesswoman. She knows how to run her business, and who, I admire that. Who do you think it, has but... longevity as an icon who's young right now? As an icon? Yes. From from what world? It depends what world you're talking about. You know, I, I'm a big lover of hip hop, for instance. Um, I think that Tobe Nguyenwe is uh, one of the most incredible new artists. Tyler, the creator, is a young man who is... Uh, an icon in the world of hip hop and has, you know, done some incredible stuff in such a short period of time. 
So by the time he's 70, I'm going to be astounded to see what he's doing. He probably won't. He'll be making movies, I'm sure. It's something different. He'll be directing feature lengths or something. Um, so there, there's, there's icons within all these different worlds. They're not necessarily don't have the mainstream success, though, you're talking about. I understand when you mentioned Taylor Swift, it's not necessarily because you're a hardcore Swifty. It's because, you know, the woman sells out stadiums around the world ongoing and has done for the last decade and will continue to do so probably. Yeah, um, I, I think I think, too, of just that um, household name recognition, which sure. is everything. Sure. Like you mentioned, there are all these kind of niche icons and people who can be icons within their their whatever field they might be in. But. I don't know. Does like your your mom know their name? No, but then again, I, again, I think that that's that's a problem. That is a problem with the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. um, to be iconic doesn't mean to be known by everyone in the world. Maybe it does as a dictionary, dictionary definition. I would have to look it up. <laughs> but um, for for me, iconic art and iconic uh, creation isn't about being known by someone's grandma even if you're a hip hop artist, you know, in the States, you don't, you know, you don't need to be known by a British grandma back in England. Um, it's about, it's about changing the way that that entire art form looks at its own art, you know, um, uh, at least growing something new within that space um, and becoming identifiable as uh, a leader of the art within that space. Mm hmm. And that's that's what the ego deaths have done to me is go like, you, dude, you can create comedy in any way you like, and for whatever reason, you don't need to ensure that you get, you know, your Netflix special, and then you go and do your one hour on Comedy Central, and then you know maybe then you get to write your own TV show, and if that does okay, then maybe you get to be in a movie, and then blah 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 blah. No, that's the machine, and there's certain gatekeepers who will ensure that only certain people go through that machine. And then there's, look, I'll give you an example. Cat Williams, you know, this is someone who has been very much uh, newsworthy over the 2024 January period yes. for his comments about vast different aspects of the, the industry and also a bunch of people he lit up and publicly called out on uh, the uh, Shea podcast. Mm -hmm. Shannon Shea, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Cat Williams is an icon, but not everyone knows him, Not neither in the industry nor in mainstream sort of home life you know but he's an he's an iconic character he's an iconic performer um and that's kind of the point like you don't necessarily need that that level of mainstream success to also change uh the very shape of the thing that you're in um i did you did you out of interest and no judgment if you did not did you manage to actually watch my my comedy special my comedy spectacular I did. I watched a lot of it. Um, and then my daughter interrupted, <laughs> uh, interrupted the Sorry. end of it. So you got partway through the stand up and then you turned it off. No, no, no. I have a I have a toddler. <clears throat> no, honestly, did you did you get to watch the animation segment or the rap music a, video segment? No, or? those are the parts that I missed. I watched um, I watched a lot of the stuff of the comedy cellar, that portion. And I loved your like just energy. That's very sweet of you. Thank you. And, and whether like you to... like the material or not, I mean, it's, it's, um, this is, this is the thing. See, like, there's, there's an example. I created a one hour piece. Uh, it's a movie. It's a one hour movie. And, it, and it, it's the whole storyline. There's a, a dramatic dialogue that, or dramedy dialogue that runs throughout, which is me in conflict with my own ego and really having the conversation through of what that means. And I and love how the I beginning of it too. Out. Thank you. Well, that runs throughout, and then there's these other segments. So at one point, you go into a series of animation where I voice all four characters, and, and they represent different uh, mental health issues that I've had over the years. But it's still funny. It's a funny three-and-a-half-minute skit. You know. Then there's a rap music video about the concept of doing anything and wanting to do everything. And I'm a, you know, I might be a 39-year-old white boy from London, um, but you know, if I want to do a rap music video, I'm going to do a rap music video. And if I want to marry an alien and become... Uh, God Eternal and End the Cosmos, I could do that too. And that's kind of what the rap music video is about. And then there's crowd work at the end, which makes it more human and empathizes with, uh, you know, with the connection between artist and audience. And then the ending is very, very involved. I, I, I won't ruin it for you if you get a chance to watch it. No, I'm thing. going, I, yeah, I'm there's going a to There's a concept, like, there's a concept, like, I, I, I tried to create something completely different in the space of comedy. 
as a one hour special. This is not like any other special that's ever been released ever in the history of comedy specials. Um, but you didn't watch the whole thing through, and I re- and I understand why. I understand why you have other responsibilities, but uh, a lot of people won't. They'll watch the beginning, they'll see some of the stand out, they go cool, and then they get bored after twenty five minutes because they don't have the attention span. That's not who I'm creating that art for. I'm creating that art for people who go, I want to see someone, a multifaceted performer, redefine what it is to release a one-hour comedy special, a debut comedy special. Yeah, and, I wish um, I had a who, more less basic excuse. No, that's all right. That's okay. And I, like, <laughs> People who watch the whole thing through hopefully walk away from that experience going, oh, cool, that changed me in some way. That had more impact than just... Ha 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 ha! This is very funny for you know forty minutes, and then there's like a top and tail of like uh, you know whatever forty five minutes, and then five minutes at the beginning, five minutes at the end, where I'm like walking into the comedy show, like hey, I'm a comedian in in New York City, <laughs> and then you know which is what the identity is for every other comedy special, right? Um, this is the point. I had a choice there. I had offers from platforms. There were people who wanted to purchase it, and uh, and I refused them because we were um, on strike at the time as SAG-AFTRA performers and union members, and I didn't want to give something that I'd worked that hard on. I didn't need their money. Yeah, I didn't want to give something that I'd worked so hard on for a year and a half making that was so different and so unique to a platform that didn't even want to pay artists properly for the work they do that makes that platform billions of dollars every year. Yeah, And so I decided to self-release. Now, it might have been the wrong decision for my career, as, as every single person, including my wonderful PR, has told me, you know, like, why didn't you sell this shit? What's wrong with you? But I don't care. I don't care anymore about mainstream success. You know, it's about, like, releasing a piece of art exactly the way I want to release it to an audience that hopefully will find it. And I hope eventually that special is done all right. It's like almost, what, 300,000 views. I hope at some point it will find a bigger audience because of some other mainstream pro, uh, project that I do that then they'll go back and watch that and go, oh, shit, this was really good. This was really different. This was something quite unique in the space. And we didn't really give it the time we should have done at the time. But, you know, that's you have to, like, not care about the wrong things, I think. I Trust me. I mean... I've said no to a lot of money that would have made my life a lot more comfortable and easy in the past couple of years, just so that I can maintain some kind of independence, the Good. ability to put out what I want to put out, say what I want to say, and not feel beholden to not just any sponsor kind of sponsor or a brand or a platform sponsor, or brand, whatever, platform, yeah. or audience. I think yeah, audience yeah, yeah. capture is very real. You know, you have. You end up. We need those, though. We need one of those. <laughs> That's the need, only thing we do need we for do, art to but, be enjoyed. But I need think a, we're you in need an, an audience to receive it. You know, you do. But I think we're in an interesting time where audience capture. And I've talked to a lot of journalists about this. Uh, not so many performers, actually. But I, 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 it, it happens to performers too. I think it's a very real thing, and you mm-hmm. can train your audience to expect the unexpected and be open-minded and know that like we always say on my show dumpster fire i'm like you know we're making burgers out of your sacred cows so just know that and not only and mine too but you have to it, it would be very easy to get trapped into a place where you have people thinking you are one way because they saw one thing of yours. TikTok is a perfect example of what you're describing, you know, becoming beholden to your audience because the algorithm feeds them particular stuff. Like my TikTok, I think I have about 250,000 followers, right? They're not there for my stand-up. That is 100% certain. They're there because I portrayed a video game character that was quite iconic in uh, a, a video game called Call of Duty a few years ago. And they're there because I'm Ghost from Call of Duty. That's why they're there. Because I know, because I see how, if I post something about video games, it gets loads of engagement. If I posted a Ghost thing, I'd get hundreds of thousands of views on it. Um, if I post stand-up clips, eh, maybe like, you know, two, two to 10,000 maybe likes, right. maybe. If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky. You know what I mean? And and so, yes, I understand the the fear of being beholden to an audience. Um, but I also think, like, you know, if you just keep consistently putting out great stuff, it finds its audience eventually. It does. Yeah. You know? Although if it's like, I know that I've had a lot of business people look at all of my content and go, you're confusing the algorithm because I do put out so many different things and i'm like good but they're like no you're never Are you confusing gonna... yourself or do you feel fulfilled yourself because if 
If it's the I latter, feel good. Then it doesn't matter. It's, it's funny. I had a like I I just started doing reels on Instagram. I, I'm not really into Instagram, but the more basic I become, um, the more I like Instagram. And one went viral. And it and it was and I think it attracted like a certain kind of audience. And then yesterday I put up a reel and I lost, you know, a hundred or two hundred followers and I was like, good. <laughs> what was the um what was the uh, the clip out of interest? The clip that went viral was about I was making fun of how like math is racist now. You know, I was okay, like, oh, now so apparently you got math some is racist. In there. Racism and you know. That and then yeah, yeah. we it was just because we've been doing dumpster fires for since 2019 for almost five years, and I don't. I've always treated it like a show. I have end credits. I thank people. I've and people are like, why are you treating this like a show on YouTube? This is not. Like you've got to open this way. You've got to do these things for this platform. And so then I started saying like, well, let's just repackage. There are lots of little clips we can make. We're just not making it. Maybe it's in the wrong package. So we started, I'm like, you know, maybe we put some on TikTok and on Reels and whatever, like who cares? And I started doing that short form and it's fun. I actually like the short form videos, but it's, I'm not generally the kind of person that likes to, just rile people up for the sake of riling them up in that right. short form like way, because I think it misrepresents a lot of what I'm trying to do. I feel <laughs> and you. yet, you know, yeah, here we are. And yet here we are. I don't yeah. know. I mean, that's what does it. Listen, we could sit on this podcast right now and we could go, we could go fuck Amy Schumer. Right. And, and, and <laughs> fuck Dave Chappelle. Right. And, and actually, you know what? Cat Williams, that little bitch as well. Fuck him too. Right. And, uh, you know, you can't just clip that out. That Those few words you stick. Right. Out, real, and people go, Whoa, what's that? What's happening? Let's go cancel him. Or let's go, you know, argue in the comment section, mm -hmm. but we're being conditioned. I think, this is, and this is not on the realm of comedy right now, but the more that I look at the world at a macro level, and that, that means mm -hmm. um, everything, finance, politics, mm -hmm. uh, health, um, healthcare, uh, uh, medication, pharmaceutical industry, uh, education as well. As I, more and more that I look, I go, oh God, it's so obvious. Like so if, if you've been privileged enough to be afforded a decent education, which I know not everyone can be, or if you have the street smarts and you've traveled enough, met enough different types of people and talked to enough different types of people, go, it's all controlled. It's, it's all controlled. It's where we are, we are moddy coddled, we are pushed and coerced and uh, uh, corralled into believing certain things, thinking certain things about other people. Um, you know, the global division that we see now between people. And I think there's a reactive, there's a reactive movement to that, which is, why so many people probably have been taking psilocybin and why so many people are going, ah, oh, maybe, you know, we can find ways to um, create content that unifies people rather than divides them. Because we are more alike than different in every way. This is what I always say. I just wrote a piece this past summer about how real America is the middle seat and coach. You know, I'm like, all these people who are trying to divide us are rich. <laughs> Like they're all very wealthy, you know, and, yeah, and the people well, it's, who are it's like top level, top level control, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's very the black rocks and your vanguard, uh, oh. your, 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 you know, your literally black rock vanguard, you know, um, Blackstone. These, these guys are run the world, which is obvious now to enough people, you know. Um, and I, by the way, I have a very strange conspiracy theory on what will happen next, what the next thing will be, right? So currently, there is this reactive movement against, you know, right now, it's, it's been politics for a long time, right and left, you know, what are you, you're a Republican, or are you, you're, a, you're a racist Republican, or are you a libtard cut liberal, you know, what are yeah. you? And you have to pick a side. Uh, it used to be, it still is in a lot of areas, but it used to be more heavily focused on racial divides or sexuality divides, you know, so right now, trans issue is probably the latest version of that. Um, but, um, as people get more and more aware of the, the fact that we're all in servitude, we're all slaves to a system and we're literally born into it. You know, financial scheme is just a Ponzi scheme. You know, finance and capitalism is a Ponzi scheme we all buy into. Once people start realizing that more, I feel like the top tier controllers are recognizing a slight, only a slight, but a slight loss of control over um, how easily manipulated the entire populace is. Most people still are easily manipulated, 
but the sharing of information over the internet means that it's easy to mislead people, but there's also pockets and avenues for people to educate one another in a very free-form manner. And that's been happening. So how do you unify a bunch of people who are starting to go, you know what, all politicians are fucking corrupt and they're that's, all in the pockets of that's lobbyists. That's what I'm seeing. And right and left, they don't give a shit about any of us. Mm-hmm. They're all, this is not, we're not protected here. Mm-hmm. Well, how, do you con- how do you control a populace that is starting to feel that way about it or starting to, you know, intermingle and, and procreate with people who are completely aesthetically different to them or, or, or accept people's pronouns irrespective of whether they're on board with it or not, whatever. You um, have to create a bigger fear, a bigger division, something that unifies everyone under your banner of, uh, of control. Now, if you didn't already know, how many, uh, how many parts of the uh, UAFs, you know, unidentified, uh, unidentified um, uh, uh, aerial phenomenon or whatever, whatever or UAP, sorry, uh, how, how much of that information has started to be publicly given out in Congress by officials sanctioned by the U.S. government and the Department of uh, the DOD um, and NASA and all of these all of these entities that used to, what, even just 50 years ago or 30 years ago, used to say if someone said that aliens exist or UA, UA, uh, U, you know, UFOs exist, they would go crazy, conspiracy theorists, tinfoil hat lunatic, and ridicule them. And now they've revealed there's actually like government agencies that led the charge on doing those things to mislead people in the media. Now they have categorically accepted and publicly stated that yes, we have recovered vessels from other, from off planet, off planet vessels. 120 in the US alone <laughs> have been, UAPs have been recovered. And the, the biggest thing that really kind of stimulates debate is oh, we also recovered a pilot not of this planet. That right. That's the way they described it. A yeah. So what they're basically saying is yeah, spaceships exist, mate. And so does so do aliens. There are sentient races out there that are far more advanced than us that have flown to this planet in a spaceship, and we've recovered that shit. They've publicly said that in Congress. So why would they drip feed that information to us at this time in uh, human civilization's development, or should we say devolution? You know, um, because I think that's the easiest way to control people as the next step. If it ever gets too bad, if the world starts getting too uh, too angry, if it feels like there's too many civil uprisings coming, how do you immediately snap everyone back into a state of control and servitude? Well, a little ship flies down, blows up a probably poverty-stricken, uh, mostly populated by people of color, because that's who they generally seem to use as the, 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 the testing grounds for all of their you know, nefarious activities. A uh, spaceship comes over, zaps uh, an area of town, kills a few thousand people, and then you know uh, the UN and the the US Air Force and even Russia get on board. All of them come together to fly some ships and take down, you know, with their F, you know, with their, their fighter jets, take down this vessel. They recover the vessel. They make public announcements. We will protect the Earth from this existential threat of other sentient life that clearly means us harm. And uh, that's how you control people for the next thousand years. That's how you get them to work even harder and dig out more of the uh, the, uh, the the various, you know, w- uh, wealth building uh, uh, metals and uh, and gems that you need. And that's how you do it. You know, you we we've, we had free energy almost a hundred years ago. You know, uh, zero point energy has been developed and patented by a bunch of scientists, and every single one of them that does that ends up having a sudden change of heart and shoots themselves in the head in a suspicious <laughs> manner or gets a sudden heart issue. You so, have so, been doing a lot of mushrooms. No, I've just been doing research. You <laughs> no, I know. Stuff, and you can go you can go and find I, I think the, it's the official climate, police the climate record. though. I mean they're already oh, that the climate will kill us before anything. No, but I mean I think that's the existential threat they're trying to manufacture to control everyone right now. That's not that's not existential. That's happening. There's a reason why Zuckerberg is building an underground bunker, mansion, expanse, you know, underground village in Hawaii on the on the private land he owns. There's a reason why people like these billionaires, like uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Mark Cuban, are selling some of their largest assets and accruing wealth to ensure that they have um, uh, enough seats on those private vessels that Elon Musk and NASA have developed and Richard Branson are developing so they can ensure that when 
the world ends up underwater, which it invariably will again, as it has done two or three times previously, when we go through that next ice age, um, you know, either you're going to go above it where you're sort of safe from it for a little while, or you go underground and sort of hide out there for a period of time. And then, uh, you know, they do the cycle all over again. Every, yeah. every single, every major, every major, um, civilization throughout history, every single one, every major religion and the- theological, uh, uh, text has outlined this, this giant flood, you know, for, 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 even if they didn't have any relationship, even if they were on opposite sides of the planet and unable to communicate those ideas. So I think it's just, it's, it's too many coincidences. And that's the problem of looking at the world from a top down, um, macro level. However, Here's the beauty, Bridget, for all of us. It doesn't matter because we're all just tiny pieces of dust in an endless expanse of pieces of dust. And we mean nothing and we mean everything. We're all related. We're all one energy and we're also nothing. So uh, it doesn't really matter. That's just the way it's, it's meant to go on this planet over and over again on repeat. So as long as you work on yourself and elevate yourself and do as many good things as you can over the course of your life to help others and benefit others in servitude to them, then, you know, you get to rejoin that one energy and go and float around the cosmos and do something else next. Shopify has already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. I love the fact that Shopify can be an online store as well as an in real life store. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash W-I-W, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash W-I-W, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash W-I-W. Do you have kids? Not yet. Mm. I did raise a child. I raised someone else's child for, you know, four and a half years, uh, Mm -hmm. a little girl. And that was um, one of the most fulfilling experiences of my entire life. Mm. Yeah, I feel like having a child has uh, changed a lot of that perspective for me a little bit. Tell like, me, in what way? Uh, just, you know, I, I totally hear what you sa- you're saying. I think in my 20s, I was very, very, and not to like minimize it at all. I think that, that, that you sound like me when I was like, doing a lot of mushrooms and I, and I was connected to the universe and I don't think I, a part of me has abandoned that, but I do feel like something happened when I had a kid. And I've said that I just recently said this on another podcast. Like I have literal skin in the game (laughs) in the future in a way that I didn't, I used to be like, well, good luck, everybody. We can all just float back into the ether and I'll do my best to leave the planet but now I feel like, oh, I'm leaving, hopefully, um, I'm leaving someone actually behind. <laughs> Do yeah. I need to secure her a seat on on the on, on the spaceship? You know, Do, I don't. I hear what you're saying. Um, uh, my response would be, would be that I, I hear what you're saying <laughs> and vice versa. I don't take it as patronizing. I'm not, I mean, I'm not in my 20s and taking mushrooms all the time. I've done three psilocybin trips. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm not. No, no, no. But I want to make it clear that uh, I get what you're saying. I I see uh, what I've let go of is I've I've accepted my lack of control over those things. Yeah. You you cannot control that. No, you're not able to control it in a singular manner or even uh, if you rallied a million people together to try and impact change. Uh, to ensure that the planet survives long enough for your child to grow up and have her own children or family and get to experience that life. You don't have the power to impact that change in any way, shape, or form. And this is what, once you, my, my, my comments don't come because I've taken mushrooms and, you know, kissed the thighs of God and decided that, you know, it's inside all of us and we're all part of it. It, it doesn't come from that. It comes from conversations with billionaires and talking to them about ecological change. It comes with conversations with 
high-ranking military professionals and veterans and asking them what's really going on behind closed doors, which they'll always tell you if you're close enough to them and they've had a couple of drinks. It's because they all want to tell the story of what they experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes from talking to friends in the financial industry who have very categorically sat down with me and really explained how much of a fucking Ponzi scheme it is and how many loopholes there are and how you know we're all being shafted into servitude. So understanding all of those things, I realized we, the planet is destined. We are fucked. This is where George Carlin came to at the end of his life, by the way, and, and why his comedy changed in the last um, 10 years of his career. It wasn't he because seemed he so mushrooms. bitter, though. He wasn't bitter. He, accepted, he just accepted that he couldn't save humanity. Now, I think there's a lot of people in comedy and in entertainment in general, myself included for the majority of my uh, child and adult life, uh, who had hero complexes. I wanted to save the world. I thought I was the protagonist of my story. I thought I'm the main character and I could have some major impact and change it for everyone for the better. I can't, I'm not, and I'm unable to. And neither are you. You're not able to protect your child from anything in the world. And that's the hardest thing for a mother or a father to accept, especially a mother, because she is literally born of your body. Mm -hmm. The concept that you can't protect her from those things. Now, what you can do is you can educate her. You can uh, inspire her to follow her passions and to make the best of the life that she has on this planet. But the simple fact is we're all fucked. <laughs> and Carlin knew that because he looked enough at history. He read the text that I read. He did enough deep dives to go into that research. And I'm not talking about some blog, you know, uh, funkyaliens.truth.com. You know, I'm not looking at documentaries on Netflix to find my, my, my information. I'm looking at the oldest texts that are available to us. I'm looking at the uh, theological texts that span the world. I'm looking at um, scientific studies being done by, uh, uh, um, you know, MIT professors and, uh, and, and residents. I'm looking at that kind of information. I'm looking at publicly available police records of the uh, the cases of the deaths or murders of these scientists that have already created free energy for us. We are fucked. We are controlled. We are under, in a state of servitude. So you've got two options. Either you can spend your life worrying about that and being concerned, how do I, how do I make this better for my daughter? How possibly can I do that? Or you let go of that and understand you can't. And all you can do is be present whilst you are here on this planet with your child and enjoy every single moment you can with them, which is what I do with my dog on a daily basis. I try and do that as much as possible and take myself out of my own mind. And a, mess a message of optimism for my child. We're all fucked. But, but this is it. It's not, it's not about optimism. You're not in control of whether things go well or, or badly. And, 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 and even on a personal, let's take it down to a micro level now, to, to an individual rather than the entire planet and population. For an individual, I spent so much of my life being concerned about how do I how do I make life better? How do I do this? How do I do that? And by holding on to the concept that I had control or power to do those things, as opposed to knowing that things bad things don't happen to me. It's just life. It's just a journey. There's bad things and there's good things. And they're going to come through your path. And if you spend less time holding on to the concern about the bad things and how you can change those and more time living presently and going, all right, something bad just happened. That sucks. That hurts. My best friend killed himself. Three weeks later, my dad dies from alcoholism. That was my life a year ago. Um, and I was holding on to that. How could I have made that better? How could I have changed that? How can I impact more change for others in that way? And, blah, 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 blah. and instead of just going, that's what's happened. Process it. Be empathetic to it, that experience. And accept that you need to live presently and focus on what the next positive is instead. Mm. Because the more you reach out for that positive, optimistic mindset, certainly, you will find your next positive experience. And then you can get back to uh, being a better version of yourself for other people. Mm. That's, 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 that's how I see it. It's got nothing to do with tripping balls and, you know, feeling like, well, man, I connected with my higher power, dude. It, it really doesn't. Um, that just was the gateway, the catalyst to allow me to stop being in my own mind. And I think that's, that's what loss of an ego is, truly. Loss mm -hmm. of an ego. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. control what happens to your child, especially not after you're gone. Yeah. You know, so let yeah. go of it. <laughs> let go you of don't. It. How much about my story do you know? Very little, I'll be honest. Um, I was going to ask you another question too. Uh, what? Wait, don't leave that open ended. There was obviously some more about your story that I need to know. That oh no, there's nothing. I was just, of... I was just curious. It was, it oh, was okay. just a curiosity. Um. Okay. Uh. So, 
I'm just trying to be clear about how I cannot care about money in this Ponzi scheme. <laughs> sure, you have to, you have to understand like that you. it is one. Here's an example. Here, let's talk about money very briefly. Um, I, I grew up in a very working class uh, family, right? My mum and dad, mum grew up in under Ceausescu's reign in Romania and Bucharest, so under a communist dictatorship and had nothing. Uh, dad grew up in East End of London under the sound of the Bow Bells. He's a proper Cockney, official Cockney, you know? Uh, it's a very working class parents. Um, they worked themselves to the bone to bring us up to a sort of working middle class existence. You know, I, we had a little holiday every year. We had a roof over our heads. I went to a decent school, but didn't pay all the school fees because I got a scholarship, you know, so they drilled into me education from day dot so I could get the scholarship to get into the good school despite not being able to afford going there. Um, and I brought, got raised with a very middle class, working class mindset of what money is. And that's how 99.999% of the population are brought up, working or middle class, understanding uh, you, you work hard, you stack a little bit of cash, you put it in a bank uh, to earn some savings or a Roth IRA or get your, your, your 401k and uh, get some health insurance. You need that. And then, you know, you've got to make sure that you save enough money to maybe get a mortgage for your house. And then you, you pay that off for the next 25 years, 35 years. And then maybe you've got something to leave to your kids and blah, blah, blah. That's not how rich people look at money. They don't look at it like that. You know, Warren Buffett famously said if he could have changed anything in terms of, to make more money over the course of his life, he wouldn't, wouldn't have bought any properties because he knows that he could have made more money just on the stock market. I realized a few years ago that I have been taught to never ask questions about money of people. And I think most people are like that. It's rude. You don't ask people how much they paid for their house. You don't ask them what their mortgage is. You don't ask people how they save money or invest it. That's rude. It's rude. I, when I got sober uh, from alcohol, I should say, because clearly I, I take you know hallucinogens every now and then. Um, when I gave up booze for almost five years ago, I had to stop lying to myself and I had to start living transparently. And I live transparently with everyone I meet now, which is uh, sometimes I realize a little, um, it can be a little, uh, a little much for some people. And I respect that. Um, one part of that though, is that I decided if I wanted to learn something and if I didn't know about it, I'm going to always tell people, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that is. Could you please educate me on this? Because I want to be a student of life until the day I die. So a few years ago, I made some money on that video game, actually not on the video game, but on everything I did surrounding the video game, um, live streaming every day, uh, sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I stacked a, a, a sizable mm. chunk of money and I talked to one of my friends who's a day trader and I said, listen. I've been wealthy maybe three times in my life, and the last two times I spent it on coke and women and traveling the world. This time, I'm not doing any of those things. So what do, how do I make this money generate more money for me? Because I'm in a profession that does, is so dangerously back and forth. You know, One month you're rich, the next month you can't pay your rent. And uh, just by asking that question, I opened myself up to a world I didn't even know was possible. And he has helped me to invest in a way where we can generate um, just trading futures on the S and P five hundred, uh, roughly around fifty percent annually on mm -hmm. my money pre pre tax. You got to give you got to give the mob their money as well. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to give them their twenty percent of that or twenty five percent of that. And so now I'm in a position where annually, my profits allow technically could allow me to never have to work ever again mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. That's possible for anyone. You just have to start thinking about money like a rich person thinks about money. Because when yeah. you put your money in a bank savings account. Nothing. It earns, what, 0 0.3, maybe 3% APR if you're, it's a top tier account. Mm -hmm. If you put it in long-term investments, you buy some VOO and VTI and stuff like that that kind of continuously will go up as inflation goes up with the stock market. You might make maybe uh, 5 to 8%, maybe 10%. Maybe you get a good trader who can do some lucky trades and you get like 13% over the year. Still great. But the banks are not doing that with your money. They're not, they're not doing the same thing. They're taking that money and they're investing it the way that my guy does to try and generate, you know, following the up and downs of the stock market every single day, trying to generate a percentage revenue, which for my guy is 0.2% daily on that money. And they're making 60% or 50 to 70% money every single year on your money mm -hmm. you know it's yeah, insane it why are we not getting that money because they don't want us rich they don't want us educated to these things it is and, that book rich dad poor yeah. dad 
Yeah. So, so again, you can't change it for everyone, but you can spread a little bit of knowledge about it, and you can also mm -hmm. just ask questions. I, I don't know what your financial situation is, what your foundation of security is, um, but. I know that you've probably got some really rich friends, and I imagine you've probably never asked them, hey, you're wealthy. You're a lot more wealthy than me. How do you get wealthy like that? Could you impart some knowledge? Would you teach me something that I'm probably doing wrong with my money and managing my finances or my savings or whatever? And they might say to you, yeah, stop paying into a mortgage, go rent a place, and take all that money, all that equity, and go and stick it into this. That's what they might tell you. Now, it'll be that could be a big shift for you. It might not be the change you want. It might not give you mentally the st stability that you're looking for as a mother and as, you know, having a child and you need a home and space. They actually told me to stop renting. Oh, I, really? I, I mean, I don't know why you would assume I wouldn't ask them <laughs> uh, well, cause, questions. Cause most, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. When I say you, I don't mean you specifically necessarily. I mean, like, you, the, the, the general, general public. But, yeah, yes. I, I, I do, you know, I'm making gross generalizations. I apologize. Yeah, they, uh, a lot of people said to um, own what you can, you know, so there's this sense of like ownership of, of. You don't own any of that shit though. Yeah, not really. It. I mean, if I didn't pay taxes, own, they'd take it away. Well, also, do you own the land that your house is on? I mean, does anyone just don't pay taxes? Some people do, yeah. Some people own the land. And then when they own the land, they still have to pay Property taxes. Money, money on it every single month. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. If it, <laughs> yeah. Nobody really owns the land, really, if you want exactly. to go down that rabbit hole. But, um, absolutely, absolutely. And and at any time, uh, a government could come and just take it back from you because they've got mm -hmm. more men, more guns, and more power to just come in and wipe you off the face of the planet if that's yeah. what they want. Yeah. Which has happened throughout history as well. So, but I so do really think that um, renting is pissing away money in a certain context too particularly oh, really? if you need a place to live you need a you need a roof over your head so renting is just a necessity mm -hmm. but it frees up equity to do other things with that money i mean look there's a reason why i'm i'm not a huge fan of of uh of cryptocurrency i don't think i don't put a lot of stock in 99.9 percent .9 of them but i mean Bitcoin, it frees the reason why up equity if you have extra money well, but you got money, and you're paying into a mortgage, and you, you got you got you had to put money down to get that that property, correct? Right, right, right. Maybe a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars at least. Right, it's just a asset transfer, from my perspective. You know, there it, it maybe I could have taken that equity and and done something like what you're doing, although that would be like phase two for me, I guess. So in in my from the people who I do talk to about this, who are much richer than me, um, that would be something that I I do in phase two of the the like plan to create wealth. That's just what me they asking, told are me. Those, are those people uh, multi millionaires? I'm talking like you know, sort of twenty million. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They're yeah. they're very. Maybe they're not telling you everything. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they don't want you to be part of that club i don't think like, so they're a, all homeowners like you know they're they're not necessarily oh, sure, they got the money to just buy a property straight up and not not have to worry about it i mean yeah. like, what i'm saying is like yeah that doesn't doesn't sound like the advice that i've been given by I, i've talked to th i've only met three billionaires that I, that have talked openly to me about these things and uh that was not their advice but but, but again i don't know I don't know. I don't know. It's yes. There's a, there's a different path for everyone. I I, I, I fully understand that, and, and everyone's going to have different experiences. Advice here. I just I'm just saying like the normal ways that we're taught to view money and how we manage it, uh, what we're meant to spend our lives working towards. You can give that shit up. The happiest people I know are not the wealthiest either. They're not the wealthiest people. They're the people who have. I don't know if you've watched this. Um, there's a documentary called Centennials, which uh, yeah. you know, looks at blue zones. Did you, yeah. did you see that? I did. Great. The, the value of those people, most of those people were not immensely wealthy. Yeah. They just had purpose every day and they had a connection and community. They had mm -hmm. a village, you know, they had really had that village living, which is why so many, I think, millennials, especially people in my bracket, are all going and moving out to the, to go and try and buy, you know, one to 10 acres of land and set up communal living situations and grow their own vegetables because they're like, I'm fed up of eating GMO fucking veggies that even your veggies aren't good for you anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I want to go and grow my own stuff. I want a simpler life. I want to wake up every day with purpose and drive and maybe then, and fresh air, maybe then I will, you know, get to live a, a, 
a life of value. And that's, again, another place that has caused conflict for me with regards to entertainment because I'm going, well, I think I probably want to be out in the woods. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just describing myself as a lunatic survivalist. I guess that could be it. I mean, know? that's very common, though. I think I think everyone, this that one of the pushes that, you know, there is a large push for people to rent, which is the top down push of places like BlackRock buying all the houses and renting them to people so that they never have that path to community or home ownership or investing in an actual place. And sure, maybe you don't own your land because of property taxes, which I completely understand. But I do think there's it's even more unsettling this kind of you will own nothing mentality as well which is um, seems disempowering to people. You know, that that doesn't seem like it's necessarily empowering people to... That's because we, we've been taught the wrong things. We've been taught the wrong things that will empower us. Owning your home, that empowers you. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Own, owning your own traumas from your childhood and moving beyond those, that empowers you. Looking internally more and more and more. We're, we're, we're pushed to look external constantly in every facet of our human lives and that's why we're so easily um misled that's why we're so divided there's a reason why kids spend their entire time staring at a screen and <laughs> laughing at other people's misfortune or calling each other terrible names in the comment sections and it's not just children it's like grown adults doing that um because we're, we're not taught that the biggest value we have is 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 internal that's that's where value really lays mm -hmm. is within oneself um personally i'm trying to sort of find that more but i also realize i'm in a privileged position to be able to do that at this point in my life and that's not necessarily a privilege that is afforded to everyone you know yeah I'd be interested to know how i would think about the world if i wasn't given a good education or if i hadn't been able to travel a bit and meet people from different backgrounds and races and religions and talk to them and meet them and connect with them um or i might even, be a very different person you know yeah or even if you were in a position where you didn't have equity from whatever to invest and not have to worry about money and you have to provide for a family and that you know that that weighs upon you and and puts you in a different kind of position than you might be in so well i do i actually do provide for a family just not a child you know i do provide right. for, for for other people in my family and i also and i have done in the past for other people's children like notably in that right 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 and i have other dependents you know i know it's a dog it's a very different thing but you know there's there's ongoing states of care that i have to provide for other people mm -hmm. um and i didn't like i didn't like have that equity it didn't land in my lap do you know mm -hmm. what i mean it was yeah. something i went i need to develop this i need to build this let me really look at what i'm doing let me be really truthful with myself about how i'm generating money or how i'm doing work or what i'm trying to achieve yeah and let me change my mindset to 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 gravitate towards a place where i have that option yeah um and it was an ongoing process it wasn't like an overnight you know an overnight fix either yeah yeah um yeah i've definitely traveled the world but i was very poor <laughs> So I had that, I was like a, a um, I don't know. It was, it I was, heard that on one of your previous podcasts. Yeah, you were talking to the, actually it might be the last one with the young lady who you shared your kind of, you were in a poor area, but you, it was an affluent area, but you were the poorest within that kind of affluent area or something like that, right? Yeah, and, well, that was more my upbringing. I think it was like yours, just like a, a little bit middle class plus maybe you know not upper middle class i think i was i was raised more around extreme wealth and um upper middle class and but when i was traveling around the world i was i was always kind of woofing and um making i would basically just try and you know work for my room and board and um I did see, I was just writing about this yesterday in Sri Lanka, just how happy the people were. You know, they Yeah, the they more just, simple the living. The, it was and, so and, simple. And also because you wake up every day. Those people wake up every day and go, I know what I'm doing today. My job is to grow these crops mm -hmm. for my village. Mm -hmm. 
and I love what I do and I've learned I know everything about all these different plants and stuff I'm connected to the earth I'm connected to my community and I provide a valuable service for other people every day that's that's where it comes from is service that's why so many I think so many people who end up leaving the entertainment industry uh, uh with whatever level of success that may be so many of them end up rescuing dogs opening up shelters for dogs or something like that or they end up going and doing charitable work as their main job and I, I think um or they end up you know killing themselves because they were so desperate to achieve a state of fame fortune success and when that's not afforded to them that it's it's soul crushing yeah um you know and that's why i say i don't know if it's a healthy endeavor for anyone to be involved in the world of entertainment <laughs> it's funny the supermodels they all ended up in most of them ended up in being of service, like starting these amazing organizations. And Naomi Campbell is now determined to give opportunities to all the people in Africa and the designers and the fashion and the stuff that she felt was ignored when they were coming up. And right. um, Christy Turlington. So you don't look her directly in the eye, otherwise she will smack you. Yeah. <laughs> Christy Charlington started a whole, you know, nonprofit for women who are pregnant and because she had a uh, kind of sounds like near death experience during her first childbirth. And so, yeah, they've all ended up kind of being of service after all of those years of being known for their beauty. And uh, it is it is a good path i guess if you have had all that luck and privilege and and opportunity to take and give it back to the world absolutely that was really when i got sober the the i think first real lesson that became apparent in so bright early sobriety was how much I got from cleaning the ashtrays out and and like making coffee. And I had to go to Costco and get the cream. And I effing hate Costco. It gives me an anxiety attack whoa, every whoa, time. Whoa, 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 whoa. I will not hear a bad word said about Costco. How very dare you, madam. That is <laughs> has been providing a service to people for a lot longer than we have. I just get panic attacks in that place. And I still went and got the cream. Magical Wonderland. It's better than Disneyland. How dare you? I just How get, I get oh, into, I mean, this is when I go into my mushroom trip, you know, brain. The $1.50 it. hot dog drink combo. Are you, igno you're ignoring the most important I'm like, everything in here is going to end up in a landfill. This is not sustainable. It's like Damn. the robot calculations start occurring in my brain. Of how does this all pan out? <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm a proud Costco member. And I am too. I am too. You just hate going in it. Well, yeah. And it was in California at the time and the stuff stacked to the ceilings in an earthquake zone. I was like, how ironic to be crushed by tons of cans in an earthquake. Seems like a... Crushed by cans at Costco. It's a lovely bit of alliteration. <laughs> I love it. It's my, my hip hop album. That's going to be your next out. comedy special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about, I made That's this. That's actually how I want to go, by the way. That That's is how, how I, I, I want to go. Be, I want to be buried alive by coffee in a Costco. In the Costco. Yeah. I um, recently just did a mix because I was thinking about, you should send me all your good new hip hop because I am the child of the 2005, 2006 era. And mm -hmm. I just still feel like it never. It was we'll send just you two the Spotify best. Spotify playlist I have that will will give you a, a, a nice smorgasbord. Oh, good! All that's on offer, yeah. I'll send you the one I just made because it was it was more of a like retrospective. I was like, I'm missing all my hip hop. The news, it's always happening. And then afterward, there's always some more of it. Wild how that works. I'm Cody Johnston, and I'm Katie Stoll, and we are the hosts of Some More News and Even More News, the very first podcasts anyone has ever made about the news. Every Wednesday on Some More News, we do a deep dive into a major news topic like corporate lobbying, why housing is so expensive, or Elon Musk's many, many insecurities. And then on Fridays, we're back for even more news to discuss the most infuriating, bizarre, and bizarrely infuriating news of the week. 
Check out some more news at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or the other ones, wherever you get your podcasts. Well, this has been a journey. Um, <laughs> so it has. <laughs> Is that where we're leaving it? All right, there you go. All right. Yeah, no. Uh, I want to ask you the same two questions I ask everyone at the end of my podcast. What's your biggest defect of character? Oh, um, that's a good question. That's a good question that I can actually easily answer, believe it or not. I've been working on eradicating all of my failings. Um, the latest one that I have conquered completely is emotional regulation in all things. So never dysregulating, uh, even if I'm deeply hurt or upset or have been wronged by someone I love very much. Um, the next one is I'm working on, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners will comment on, is monologuing. I need to uh, learn to allow even more room for other people to speak. I talk a lot. And um, what do you, I, what I, does I, that look like? Um, not allowing for emotional dysregulation. Like how, how oh. does it? So I'm, um, I uh, haven't for many years, you know, ever let my, um, my, uh, I've been doing therapy for quite a few years. The mushrooms also helped with this process, but basically I realized that I had, I was still just a sensitive little boy who I was trying to protect a sensitive little boy who wasn't protected in a number of ways as a child. And that made me quick to upset if someone wronged me or someone, I saw an injustice happening. I had to always jump into action. Like, all right, this is for me to sort out. Uh, example, someone gropes a female friend of mine at a bar when we're out. I'm the one who has to go and punch the guy in the face. Not healthy responses, not healthy ways to deal with that situation, but what I felt was right. Like the hero um, complex you were talking absolutely, about. Absolutely. So I worked on, 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 on that. Now that I've sort of put myself in a state of peace with who my kid is and I've sort of, you know, told him it's okay and that he doesn't need to worry anymore and that I'm now in a position that no one's trying to harm me. Things are not happening to me. They're just happening in life and I, I, I need to not hold on to them. Now that I've completely eradicated that voice in the head, the ego that just talks consists constantly, incessantly, you're not this, you're not that, you're not doing enough of this, you should be doing this, look at that person, they're doing this, blah, 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 blah. Just that self-loathing voice is gone. Um, I'm now in a position to emotionally regulate in all situations. I'll give you an example. I was meant to be married May of this year. Um, I was in a relationship for four and a half years with a woman and... Um, uh, the end of last year, maybe four months ago, three and a half, four months ago, she decided she didn't necessarily want to be in the relationship anymore. She wanted to focus on herself. I think the real reason being that she wanted to focus on her own career and her own life and her own, her own process of evolution. Um, and potentially just be single and enjoying what single life brings as well. Uh, which makes sense to me. She didn't have much time between her previous relationship and our relationship. So she probably needed more time to enjoy that period. Um, that was heartbreaking to me. When I found out some of the things, some of the reasons and some of the stuff that had been going on in the background, I screamed and shouted. I said a lot of mean things. We had an argument. Uh, she was very upset. And I'm a big guy screaming and shouting about how angry I am. Now, I've never physically threatened anyone that I care about in ever in my life and never would. Um, so there wasn't a threat of that, but me just being that angry and that upset and saying mean shit to try and hurt her in the way I felt hurt was emotional dysregulation mm. that I don't ever want to repeat for the rest of my life with yeah. anyone that I care about. Yeah. So I've worked on it and I now know with all certainty that that will never be an issue for me ever again. I will never. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, everyone I've spoken to has gone, you know, if you were facing the reality that maybe she was looking elsewhere for affection, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's pretty human for you to scream and shout, Jeff, and be upset. That's, that's not, not, that's not unnormal. Mm -hmm. And I agree. It's not unnormal among society, but it's not how I want to be. Right. It's not, it's not, it's, it's, it was one of the last remaining shit parts of myself that I couldn't just be hurt and exist in a place of hurt and recognize I'm hurt. I'm deeply hurt by what just happened. I need to be on my own. I need to remove myself from this person and go and walk around the block a few times or even drive to a friend's house and go and stay there tonight and 
calm down and cry and breathe and work out how I feel about this experience and what I've learned and what I'm finding out about my partner. I need to be able to do those things. And then when I'm ready, as a mature 38-year-old bloke, then I need to go back and talk to this person and say, all right, what happened and what I've learned has hurt me. Here's my boundary. I think that's overstepped it. And uh, I think, you know, I think you're right. We shouldn't be together. And and, and uh, I wish you'd told me this a few months ago, but, you know, before I started booking wedding venues, but, <laughs> you know, um, and, and so that's where I'm at now. Uh, you know, I had, a, I had a very real experience of it with a girl I was dating recently who got drunk and acted really mean and really nasty. Um, and uh, I let her and I felt pain and I felt embarrassed and I felt hurt by the way she was speaking and uh, disrespected in front of work colleagues, et cetera, and all these things. And instead of reacting, I just went, okay, I feel all those things. But that's all right. She's not doing this because she wants to hurt me. She's doing this because she's drunk and she doesn't have control over. She hasn't spoken to a therapist. That's why. So I need to recognize that. And it's okay to feel hurt, but then I'm not, I'm not going to let, let myself react from a place of hurt. Mm. So I didn't. And then I spent you know, 24 hours calming myself and being in a good place. And then when she said, what, what's changed between us? I said, well, you know, this, this thing happened and you said this thing. She didn't even remember saying it. And I was like, well, that's a problem as well. That's a red flag for me. So yeah. I think we're better off not spending time with each other. I wish you the best of success and you know, joy in your life. Mm. Now, that's, a, that's, that's the way that I want to react to things that hurt me. Right. With right. control. That's something, look, you know, if, you, if you're in recovery as well, you mentioned that you, got, you, you, you live in a sober life. So I assume potentially you went through a process of recovery. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest parts of it, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the, the, the power and wisdom to change the things I can. I, I do have power over. Yes. I have power over that of my own reactions. I have a choice. Mm -hmm. So now I can control that completely. That's, that's emotional regulation for me. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that I've ticked off. The final thing is what I'm doing right now, <laughs> which is just talking too much and too long and just not pausing and going, maybe I've already made my point. I just shut the fuck up. I, it sounds like you've had uh, a rough couple of years and I just want to hug you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I would absolutely happily accept that hug. And, and yeah. knowing it comes from a loving mother as well of a beautiful child, you know, that's that. I know it's going to be a good hug. Moms just... know how to give a good hug. Yeah, I think you're handling it all very maturely, but it does sound like there's been some pain there and um, that is unfortunate. And if I have gathered the information correctly, it also sounds like you raised this person's child for four and a half years. No, no, sorry. That was a, that was a previous relationship from many years ago. Okay, um, yeah, I wasn't sure. Because it was the Although four and a half year time. So I yeah, was like, the, is this the same? The end of that relationship was pretty miserable as well. And, uh, you know, I was told I couldn't see or speak to the little girl because she, she wasn't mine. She doesn't, yeah. she's not yours. You can't speak to her, you know. Yeah. Which, that crushed me because, yeah. you know, I think there's a child there who's going to now think that the two men who should have loved her most in the world just up and left, you know, yeah. she never had random in issues, but, um, out of your control, out of my control. Mm. Absolutely. So, you know, and at the time I didn't say that I kept sending Christmas presents, birthday presents and stuff like that. And they all got sent back to me. It was, it was mm. a nightmare. Oh, wow. Um, you've been on a path. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. What is your biggest asset? What's my biggest asset? Empathy. I try and find, um, connection in everything I do, especially my comedy now. Whether it's you know getting on stage and telling some dick jokes at the comedy center in Las Vegas, but still trying to make every single show personal to the audience that's there, and and uh, and find human connection in in the material that I talk about. You know, aging, love, loss, grief, heartbreak. Um, those are the subject matters I, I care about talking about because I think they bring people close together that you can laugh and then hopefully people walk away from that going, you know what? It made me think a bit about my breakup and oh yeah, maybe you had a couple of points there. There was a maybe there was an intelligent subtext to that dick joke. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> For real, you know. Uh, if if <laughs> you pivot out of are you going to continue doing comedy to come yeah, full circle? I think it's a service. I think I yeah. think it's I think making people laugh here's what i realized um the most valuable thing when we go back to everything we've talked about over the podcast 
I don't put money as a value. It's just a, it's just a freedom for me. It's just a way to, to a gateway to be able to do some of the stuff that I want to do. Um, the most valuable thing any person can give you is their time. Mm -hmm. I agree. So every time I step on stage, before I go on stage, I remind myself, even if I'm having a terrible day or I'm like, oh, whatever, or it's, oh, it's a small audience tonight, or oh, those people were shit face and they're shouting out the other comics or whatever. I remind myself, every single person here has given me this 15 to one hour time period for me mm -hmm. to entertain them. And they are genuinely here to laugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So be grateful. I feel that yeah, I feel that way about everything I do. You know, if they read something, if they listen to something, being on stage, very, I Com always comment feel- Comment on your podcast episode, yeah, share something that share you've made. Yeah. I always feel very humbled by um, any time anyone grants me any attention. It really is the most precious commodity that we have is that the time- Because you can't get that back. Money comes yep. and goes- Items, products, you know, every anything you can, yeah, like everything else you can replace. Mm -hmm. Time, you will never get those 15 minutes back when you're watching someone. Do yeah. Stuff. My little Buddhist reading to yesterday was about how the moment, you know, that the moment you born, you begin to die. The moment yeah. you're born, you, you begin to die and to kind of just keep that center to your <laughs> life experience and it's hard it's hard Absolutely. we have a lot of things pulling at us at all times and i feel like i have been reminded today in general but just by this podcast too which is just reinforcing something i was feeling right before we even started talking which is i'm not taking that time every day which it used to be a practice for me and motherhood just you know i have big intentions watch your watch your entire show baby wakes up crying like i i'm not in control of my time i can't believe i got heckled by a fucking toddler unbelievable i'm, I'm it, it's it's a very strange thing for someone who is single as long as i was to have like a manager of my time. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. she's the CEO of my time now. And now she started talking and she'll be like, walk with me. I'm like, I feel like I'm about to get fired <laughs> as your mom. Uh, walk with me. <laughs> I'm sure you seem like you're a wonderful mom. You, you're very dedicated to your child. So I'm sure that's not going to happen. But Oh, it's funny though. But it is, it is, it you're is not strange. In control of that. Hey, to listen, I mean, maybe one day she will fire you for a period of time maybe, maybe she will become a, a a dramatic teenager who doesn't want you to be in her oh, life that's, for a minute yeah and almost if inevitable that happens, you know you just have to keep sharing love and uh, leaving that door open for that and as yeah. long as she knows she has that then you know that's what you well can where do. can we find you i am going to finish your special and blast it out um where can yeah, we find you, you think of it once you watch the whole thing actually yeah um uh so i guess i would like to maybe push people towards a, a couple of different things um one would be the the comedy spectacular so it's, it's called jeff leach presents a comedy spectacular it is available free on youtube on my youtube channel jeff leach uh sorry youtube.com forward slash jeff leach tv that's j-e-double-f-l-e-a-c-h and then also i've got a brand new podcast of my own actually called comic cougar convo with my very dear friend uh who is a, an award-winning sex worker and uh, uh the internet's stepmom uh, Cherie Deville and oh, it's I love her. Comic. She's amazing. She's and been on the podcast. Comic. Oh, is she? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So she's one of my best mates. We play Dungeons and Dragons together every week. Um, oh, really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. We're a couple of nerds. Yeah. My yeah. husband's hugely into Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, it's it's magical. You should yeah. if you have not yet created a character, that would be a lovely little bit of respite from being a mum and a fun way to um. I Tonight, want him to teach all season. of us. Yeah. You should. You should. He's you should so it. into it. He's just, I, he wants to start playing again so badly. Oh, he doesn't play in a regular sh match? Or a Not regular really, game because or... he was playing online, and then it, he was, it, it, it was very hard for everybody to find that time, and it's like that meme, how do you get all these people? But know, now yeah. he's been, yeah, I, I think that's kind of like his dream is to get back he into. Should DM. He should become a DM. And, and run his own game and he, then he is that's like, what he yeah. normally is so he awesome. so yeah i think that's more what he's used to and he's definitely like a nerdy i i know nothing about it but he is he's got the you know miniatures and care like all kinds so of much fun it's yeah so much he loves fun. it it's escapism it's a clean form of escapism you know yeah you get 
socialize and have community and it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And it really um, like, he thinks it's this very, he's explained it to me as like the purest form of storytelling, yeah. just how you can create these worlds and stories and, and fun uh, to play with performers, by the way, and entertainers, like a bunch of our, we have, we have a magician, we have two porn actors, we have uh, a guy who worked, worked for SpaceX. We got um, we got a bunch of like really interesting creative people. We got an, an animation artist in there, and uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun, and funny. Um, but yeah, you should absolutely kick it, kick it off with him, and be a part of your your campaign together. And you could even have the baby there with you. You know, that's yeah. not something you have to like. Re you don't have to put your baby down to do that. You can have your baby yeah. on your knee, being part of it, chewing on the end of a maybe not chewing on the miniatures because some of them are made out of lead. I don't want so, to be responsible for no. What's the um? The your what's child. your That'd podcast your... about? Uh, it's a conversation between two best friends who are very nerdy about all facets of life. So we have a different jump off subject matter each time, and we dress them thematically to the episode. We have a set design thematically to the episode that we're discussing. But we, um, you know, the first, uh, the first, um, the first sort of six episodes, for instance, kind of span a such a such a vast array of subject matters the first one was uh was guns we've got episodes on money future uh, sorry the future strip clubs prostitution video games beauty food and it will be an ongoing series so uh yeah it's a weekly installment it's uh available free on youtube again on um youtube.com forward slash at comic cougar convo and then there's a patreon page as well if they want episodes early um and then i'm just at jeff leach on all social media as well so if you you want to say hello please do yeah tell sheree i said hi she was fantastic on the podcast and it was really funny because she was writing about you know the porn industry has always been ahead of like the financial back the you know mastercard shutting things down and now Absolutely, conservatives yeah. are starting to see this and trying to create this parallel economy et cetera, et cetera. and she mm -hmm. it was really funny listening to a lot of my um, people who might lean more conservative talking about how much common ground they had with her in this department. It's like Absolutely. where the conservatives and the porn stars are like that meme shaking hands, like parallel alike. come on. And, yeah. It's almost as if we're all more alike than we are different. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that's my, yeah, that's the sort of the, the motto for my life. I think at this stage, I love that. That's a great place to end. Yeah. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you for letting me come on and talk. I appreciate um, you. I appreciate you. Pluto TV is TV the way it should be, free. With over 300 channels, thousands of movies and TV shows, costing zeros of dollars. So if you want to watch shows like Ghost, The Walking Dead, CSI, Star Trek, or The Price is Right, well, The Price is Right, it's free. Hit movies like Braveheart, Sonic the Hedgehog, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, or Mean Girls won't cost you a thing because everything is free. All you have to do is download the app, which, by the way, is also free. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. It's the end of an era as we know it. <laughs> it's the end. I mean, who's really listening to this check-in? A lot of people say the check-in's their favorite part, but, you know, that's a probably still a small number of people. It's like 10 people. Yes, so the announcement is. The death of the check-in. No, it's not going to die. We're just going to put it behind the paywall. There will be no more check-in on the front-facing Walk-In's Welcome podcast. We are putting it behind the paywall at fetacy.com. Yes, and we're not guaranteeing every week, maybe once a month. <laughs> so we don't bore you with our chat about the weather. Yeah, it's time. We're just making walk-ins welcome a straight conversation with Bridget and her guest. Yeah, we don't need the check-in. No one needs to hear about our stupid daily lives. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is more personal too, and I feel like all that stuff should just go behind a paywall. You yeah, know? It just sure. it feels like that should be extra content for people who want to know more. And they should have to yes. pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Look, people, I've got to make some money. If you want to hear about what I'm cooking for dinner tonight, then you need to go subscribe to fetacy.com. If you want to hear about the new furniture I got for my <laughs> apartment, you've got to go subscribe. Yep. It'll be 
No, I love I love the check in. I just think it deserves to be its own in its own special place. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And it's also just like we initially started it because the person who basically wanted you to do the podcast was like, oh, I thought it would be more about like you and your daily life. So uh, we I was started, like, why did we start the check in? <laughs> do the check in so that people could get like a taste of you and your daily life as along with your guests. But now I think we've walk ins welcome is established as what it is. And I don't think we need like the check in feels kind of tacked on at the end. Yeah, I agree. It's just kind of um, I was thinking about that. Why? Why did we start it? I was like, why did I start this? And it was kind of something I did in my very first podcast. We we always started with a check in, which it that was more of that kind of podcast anyway. Right. You were talking about your personal yeah. lives and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And this one, yeah, it just doesn't really match. I mean, we don't need it. We don't even need to put it behind no. the paywall. I feel I feel less and less it. like sharing my personal life with the world too. Right. Because there's so, we're I'm doing so much other stuff and and I actually think the the place where it's the strongest is for me comedy and writing. So yeah. if I'm when I do get personal, generally it's in writing or it's on, in comedy and and that's I guess like I could sometimes I'll use the check in to you know flesh out a bit or something will come out of it, but. I can do that by myself, like Bill Burr, <laughs> and just sit and rant about my day. What about traffic? What's the yeah, deal so with if you're traffic? Truly, truly, like invested in the check in, and you're not a subscriber, and you subscribe to fetacy.com specifically, you need to tell us. Like, I subscribe specifically to get the yeah, check in. Tell us that you're subscribing for the check in. Otherwise, we might do away with it entirely. <laughs> <laughs> for now, I can see us doing it like maybe like a monthly check-in. <laughs> yeah. We're slowly dialing. We're busy. We, no, we are. Get, and people say that. To, to I forget about it when until people point it out. But like you're doing a lot get, of things. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to streamline what we are producing and making it like a a better sleeker version of all of this, the main content that we're making. So the kind of side stuff needs to fall away. We're cutting out all the fat. Yep. So mm, there you have it. Anyway. So this will be our, our last check-in. Last check-in on Walkins Welcome. Dun, dun, dun. I feel like we should have like some tap. Maybe we should play taps. Do, 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 do. do. <laughs> Some veteran will be like, how dare you? <laughs> and do we end on that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. This has been Walk-Ins Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs> <laughs>